Hi and welcome to the show. My next guest political career spans over three decades, beginning as a land economist in 1984 and rising through various ministerial positions to Vice President of the Republic of Kenya, to Deputy Prime Minister and to a presidential aspirant for the United Democratic Forum Party in 2013. He is currently the leader of the UDF party and also manages the Mudavadi Memorial Foundation Trust Fund set up in 1997. Honorable Musalia Mudavadi, welcome to the scoop. Thank you very Honorable much. Mudavadi, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We were talking before the interview a little bit about uh, a Quaker, uh, the Quakerism and, yes, and, and, yes. and being part of that. Explain a little bit to me because it's the first time I'd actually known about or heard about this particular part of Christianity. Mind telling me a little bit about, about the religion? What does it teach you? What are the values that, that, that it instills in you? Yes, well, there are two fronts. Let me take it up on two ways. First of all, the background of Mr. Mudavadi Sr. Mm. Uh, is very interesting because um, his father was uh, a local gold miner um, in Kakamega. And uh, he was then one of the victims who were buried in a gold mine. Uh, and he was just about nine years old. So he's, he's a fellow who had also grown out of hardship. So that is one mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. that I think needs, I need to put in perspective. Now, coming to Quakerism, Quakerism is uh, a Protestant, uh, a Christian Protestant uh, denomination. Uh, people sometimes mistake it for a cult or something like that, but that is not it. It's just the way you have the Anglicans, um, the way you'd have the, the the, the Presbyterians and so forth. So Quakers are what you would call the friends. Um, this is uh, uh, a religious uh, society uh, that started um, uh, uh, basically in the United States, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, also in the United uh, Kingdom. They have a lot of strength in terms of simplicity. Um, if you go to a Quaker church, you are not likely to find uh, the cross in, fr in front. You're not likely to see their priests in uh, a lot of regalia, uh, the way you would find it in the Catholic Church or in the other. But they are Christians. And um, they are strong in, ed in education. Uh, they are strong in health facilities and so forth, uh, in humanitarian activities. Uh, the Quaker Church is one, is the only religious organization uh, that has a seat uh, in the United Nations, as part of the non, um, part of the religious uh, uh, advisories, advisories. Yeah. and uh, occasionally, uh, every two years or so, uh, there's a representative from the Quaker Church in Kenya who goes to Geneva mm -hmm. for the UN conferences. So it is recognized mm -hmm. even to that mm -hmm. extent. We are interesting in the sense that uh, we provide some of the best schools. If you went to the U.S., for instance, um, there's, there's a school in Washington. Uh, Hillary Clinton's daughter, or Bill Clinton's daughter, Chelsea, went to a Quaker school uh, in Washington. And so many other people yeah. go to these kind of institutions. Yeah. There are many Quaker schools in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the U.K. which instill discipline, uh, good conduct, and so forth. In, uh, uh, in, in the younger, uh, younger people. Quakers have been very interesting people in our history. Uh, I saw some famous, some very famous Barclays Quakers. Barclays Bank yeah. was started by a Quaker who was called Barclay, who was entrusted in those medieval times mm. by the people, because he was a respected person in uh, the community, that as they went to war, they would leave him with their, with their wealth. With their wealth and they would come back, and this is how Barclays Bank eventually uh, grew. Um, uh, the, the person behind the Cadbury uh, chocolate mm -hmm. was also uh, a Quaker in the very beginning. So these are the kind of people, both simple but also innovative. But it, it has a strong aspect of uh, Christianity, be faithful and be good. And in Kenya, there are so many schools sponsored by uh, the it Quakers. It also switches non-violence and, and, and non tolerance. Non-violence, tolerance, tolerance. Uh, patience. Mm. Uh, and I think um, one of the things that uh, drew the attention of people in Kenya is that um, when I was taking the oath of office, uh, 
Yes, I was uh, about to ask about the oath, actually. <laughs> when everybody yeah. carries the Bible, yes. uh, or the Quran, or, or the whatever Quran, it is, yeah. to swear yes. uh, their, their allegiance to, to, to the state and, and uh, to the constitution, uh, we affirm, I carry my right hand. Okay. okay. I read the oath, but I carry the right so hand. So you don't carry we the Bible? We don't swear by the Bible. On a book? Oh, yeah. No, that's yeah. it. So this but is the interesting thing about the Quakerism. It's, it's fascinating, and, yeah. but you know, what really interests me is you know, the whole non-violence mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. And yet, one of your great hobbies was one of the most violent sports mm -hmm. in the world was rugby. You <laughs> played rugby for your high school, and yes, then you played yes. for Mean Machine, one of the top league teams yes, in yes, Kenya here. Yes. And you know, it's pretty violent sports. So how did you balance that out with the, with the religion? Did you used to tell dad that, listen, you know, it's, it's, it's just a sport. I mean, this, this is a sport. It has nothing to do with... Because uh, you, you beat people up on the rugby field, I'm no, sure. No, no, no. no. You, you don't beat people up. You, you sidestep them. Oh, well. uh, or you tackle them yeah. low. It's, it's, it's a fitness sport. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, I don't like boxing. Okay, okay. all right. Um, uh, as a sport, um, but I've seen some of those but, mean machine but, players. And but rugby is fun for because, <laughs> because you are running with it. Uh, the, the, the objective is not to hit uh, the other person. The objective is to score a try. So I really, wish you had told that to some of the people I played against uh -huh. because I got hit all the time. Uh -huh. I think I needed to get that. Uh, we'll be right back with Honorable okay. Musali and Munavari uh, talking about politics in Africa. Stay with me. Where do you want to go in Africa? Join On The Road for The Majesty. Taste. Action. Beauty. And history of our home. Hi and welcome back. I'm here with Honorable Musalia Mudavari. Honorable Mudavari, we were talking about, I mean, politics has been a huge part of your life, three decades of it. Tell me about politics in Kenya. I can tell you the Kenyan political scene is extremely turbulent. Uh, the most unfortunate aspect of it is that um, ethnicity mm. is still deep-rooted um, in, in, uh, in our politics. Uh, just when you think that um, um, it is subsiding, it resurfaces um, uh, again. So I feel that that is perhaps the biggest hindrance in Kenya's uh, politics. I've also noticed that people shy away from discussing issues. You tend to feel that uh, they jump to, to, the, to the simpler sides of politics, mm -hmm. either to try and look at the personality and concentrate a lot on the personality. Um, but that's the fault of the politicians, not really the fault of the people, because no, they've never no, been I, presented no, I with agendas. I, th I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's both ways, because mm. uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, a number of Kenyans don't like reading uh, to get to the root of the, of the issues. Um, they would prefer the lighter uh, aspect, and sometimes this is where you miss out on, on, on aspects of uh, getting to focus on issues as they should be. Let me give you a good example which is more recent. There's debate now in the country about uh, uh, whether to have a referendum or not yeah. and what issues to put on the table. Now compare that with the debate that we have been having on the Scottish um, uh, independence, in, vote. independence vote. Yeah. When you look at how they were handling the issues, what does an independent Scotland mean to, to, to the European Union? What does it mean to the position of the United Kingdom in the UN Security Council, where they have a permanent seat? Um, what does it mean to their economy? They looked at issues. They, they looked, looked specifically at, at how it was going to affect them. Precisely. Economically, politically, militarily, precisely. Uh, and, and uh, immigration-wise. Yes, yes, I agree. Now, compare that to what we are seeing. People are looking at it that this referendum is building so and so as an individual. Mm. Mm. Uh, this referendum is against uh, uh, this party or this, this person. This, this person. Yeah. Then you're missing, you're missing the point. Um, 
I, I, I propagated the devolution. I led the, 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 the legislation that came up with our devolved uh, system of government. It was not supposed to be a one-off thing. It's supposed to be a progressive uh, Did you think we were ready for devolution? No. Well, we were ready for devolution, but it has to be progressive. Mm. But what is happening is that some people think that it must be instant medicine. You know, you have but a headache, Kenyans, you Kenyans, have a headache, take your Panadol and... Kenyans and, and Africans in general have looked for quick fix this solutions. This is it. And, and yet we're still a very young democracy. Precisely. 30 years, funny, interesting anecdotes that you can share. You don't have to give me names of people, <laughs> but you must have seen, yeah. you must have seen everything. That, well, that's coming well, on. Well, I mean, uh, no, not necessarily everything, but I've seen a things. lot. I've seen so, most things. Is there anything you can share without uh, giving out any, any confidential uh, state uh, secrets? Uh, uh, no, there will not be state mm. secrets, but I can share with you some light moments. Mm. Um, once you enter politics, by the way, your, your life changes. You know, uh, particularly when uh, you, you become, say, um, uh, not just a member of parliament, but say a minister. Mm. In a, in, in a government, your code of conduct immediately uh, has got to change. Um, you'll not find somebody in uh, in, in, in in the pubs uh, mm. that easily uh, because everybody is watching. That this guy is here. What is he doing? Who is he seated with? And it becomes worse with the phones now. Yes. Because if somebody thinks that you're being mischievous. Yeah. Uh, immediately, on social media. Uh, they're on yeah. social media yeah. that we are with this fellow here, yeah. and yeah. he's behaving like uh, yeah. some goon of, yeah. of some kind. Not that so, it stopped a lot of our politicians, no, no, but, 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 but anyway, but, I, but I, I get your but, point. But let me give you a light yeah. moment, um, and I, I'll not hide in uh, mentioning names, um, because it's not derogatory. But uh, there was one occasion um, we thought with some of our friends that we need to have a light moment. So I went to Galileo then. Mm -hmm. Which is a restaurant? Uh, not the current one, mm. the old Galileo restaurant. Near the casino. Near the casino. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was the, the, the one of the top social uh, joints at that time. And uh, I happened to go there and uh, the then Attorney General also was there. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, our light moments, uh, we danced and so forth. Then surprisingly, um, the then head of state, uh, President Moy, called uh, uh, an abrupt meeting <laughs> in, the, in the morning. Uh, Which was morning now, it was getting to be morning, I assume, yeah, so by this point. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to quickly get there. And uh, when we got there, uh, he said, I would like to talk to these two gentlemen first. Mm -hmm. So we went into his office before the formal meeting and he just threw one question and says, what were you guys doing in Galileo? <laughs> <laughs> and we were tongue-tied. <laughs> And believe you me, I never went back to Galileo after. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you were watched all the time. You were watched. And this is in the era before mobile phones uh, and technology. Uh, well, the mobile phones were there, but uh, yeah. here is one person who was <laughs> able to monitor and know uh, what uh, his people were up to. The youth is our future. Correct. Uh, this is the youngest continent in the world. We'll have the youngest population. Mm -hmm. uh, social media means that people are getting connected. Mm -hmm. How will this change Kenya and Africa? Um, how is this new technology going to move things the way they've never moved them before? Um, I think it's, it's a very positive development. It's, 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 it's really going to transform Kenya. It's going to transform Africa. Uh, it's it's speeding up the pace of uh, connectivity uh, between um, African young people, African people, and the rest of the world. So I look at it as a very, very positive development. Uh, my only concern, ultimately, is the content um, that we may share or that the younger people uh, are sharing. But I can tell you, um, the world would be worse off if this improved communication was not in place. You can have a great young population 
you can give them a great education, but if you don't give them opportunities after they get their education, it's going to lead to bitterness, to unrest. Um, how, as a, as a, 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 both as a Kenyan and as a politician in Kenya, how would you address some of these issues and what do you see needs to happen in order for us to not go down that route where we probably can't afford mm -hmm. a revolution in most African countries. We, it would take us back more than it would take us forward. African leaders must realize that uh, their nations are no longer islands. Mm -hmm. this, this is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, you can no longer suppress uh, or, or obstruct the people in your country from accessing information on what is happening. Uh, elsewhere. So if there's a lesson to be learned from uh, the Arab Spring and others is that it is absolutely essential that um, uh, African leadership all over uh, must uh, push and ensure that there is good governance, there is social equity uh, in their respective countries. Uh, that is a must. Mm. And uh, the leadership must not just be political leadership. It must be uh, the people in business, uh, the people in uh, different uh, profession uh, that, uh, that, that run or have an influence uh, on the country. They must all work together. Um, regimes must become participatory. People must be involved. And that's the only way we can seriously avoid uh, what we are seeing in, in some of those countries. What appears in, um, that's why I said it's the content. Mm. The problem is not the social media. Um, it's what you put on it. It's what you put on it. Mm. If people see that countries are being run well and so forth, this will automatically find its way into the social media. It's, I do not subscribe to this business of, 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 of showing either terrorist activities or, mm. or, or that kind of thing. Those people are putting it there because they know it's a tool. Mm. But if if countries are run well and people are participating, uh, then Africa will be uh, destined uh, to become a key player into the future. We'll be right back with Honorable Musalia Mudavadi talking about his future and the scoop. Stay with me. Hi, welcome to Women on Top. I'm Crystal Lankel. And I will be joining in. I'm Rithika Puran. Women in Africa are rising to the top. They are keeping things moving. From their businesses. Uh, fashion is my passion and I've always loved sewing, creating designs. To shaping their industries. From personality profiles. to issues affecting women. And the ordinary woman making a change in people's lives. I think it's the issue of um, um, educating, doing more outreach work. From me, Crystal Lankel. And me, Rithika Purang. Have an entertaining week. As we dance to Omawumi. <laughs> Every week, we put the woman on top. Hi and welcome back. I'm here with Honorable Musalia Mudavari. Your future, Honorable Mudavari, where do you see yourself going next? Another run at presidency in the next elections? Yes, I, I, I look forward to that. Um, um, I've not retired from politics. Mm. And uh, right now I'm involved in uh, further reorganization of uh, the political party that uh, I am part of uh, with other members so that we can uh, prepare ourselves and start looking at um, how we'll improve our fortunes um, in, in, in the subsequent um, uh, uh, elections. So that is still on board. On the social front, um, uh, we are also involved uh, as, as a family uh, on uh, social or charitable mm -hmm. uh, programs. 
um, through the Modavadi Memorial Foundation, we are part of, uh, we set up a hospital, two hospitals now. One is uh, uh, an eye hospital in conjunction with the Lions mm -hmm. and CBM in uh, Germany. They operate on people with problems of eyesight. Uh, we are happy to say that it has grown to the extent that uh, students of medicine are now being sent there uh, by the universities. Uh, and, and, and we see this as a very, very mm. big achievement. Uh, that's one. Of course, there's another one which is more of a general hospital. In terms of your own personal mm -hmm. family and kids, mm -hmm. ambitions for them, would you like them to continue living on this continent? Well, you might send them over overseas to university well, or whatever, but well, would I'd, you want them to come back here? I'd, I'd like them to, be, to, to go to school well. Mm -hmm. uh, they've studied here or up to their two uh, air levels. Uh, I have two boys now in university mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they taking? What are they studying? Uh, one is uh, studying uh, uh, economics and business management, and another is gone into politics and international <laughs> relations. So they took both took uh, one aspect uh, of one your aspect passion. <laughs> I don't know what my daughter is going to do, uh, but, but I think to me, um, a, a, any parent uh, owes it to to to. Uh, his children, um, give them uh, the best you can. Mm. Um, let them be uh, enriched uh, in terms of skills. That is absolutely uh, important. And uh, I have to play my role as a, as a parent on that score. And uh, I take it very, very uh, seriously. I can discuss with them their interest uh, but I do not want to force any of them uh, to take up something mm. if they do not find passion. Things you're most proud of? I mean, the one thing that you can look back and say, this is my proudest to date. I'm sure there'll be more achievements as, as you see, still a young man. I think, I think um, uh, perhaps there may be issues that relate to my role in, um, in politics. One, I feel very happy that I was uh, part of um, the peace process uh, when Kenya was in a crisis after the 2007, uh, um, eight elections. You remember the chaos in the country? Yep. The fact that I uh, was in the panel that negotiated the truce and, 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 and brought the, 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 the reconciliation process uh, with uh, uh, people like Kofi Annan steering it, uh, Grasha Marshall and uh, Benjamin Mukapa of, uh, mm. of uh, Tanzania. And I was leading the, the, the then ODM uh, side of the negotiations. Um, I feel that that was very good because in the middle of insanity, uh, we got together and we were able to restore come in this country. So I think that is one of the moments uh, that, that I really feel proud about. Uh, people may take it for granted, but I saw children with bullets having ripped their heads and, and, and all that. And uh, I can tell you, um, never underestimate the value of peace. Mm. Never underestimate the value of peace. Uh, the other side that makes me proud is um, um, the fact that uh, my tenure as Minister for Finance, I literally uh, drove, I was Minister for Finance for five years, and, and I, I drove the liberalization of, of our economy. Um, it was a trying moment uh, to remove price controls, to, to, uh, to have our shilling uh, floated and then the laws that came in subsequently uh, to change uh, the central bank role, to even limit the tenure of the governor of central bank to two terms. Um, all these issues around good management of the economy that I spearheaded at that time, again, a source of pride uh, for me. Regrets? If you could wave a magic wand and do it all again, what would you change? If I had an opportunity, I would, uh, can we perhaps review our constitution? Because we made it too top heavy. 
too know, complicated. Too complicated. Uh, though I, uh, it's, it's, it's a decent co constitution, it's a good constitution, but um, the wage bill uh, that has now been uh, put on the taxpayers is something that is scary. And maybe at an appropriate time as we move into the future, a reflection on, on this might be very useful. Honorable Bunavadi, the show is called The Scoop. Mm -hmm. I always ask my guests to give me something that maybe nobody else knows about them or very few people know about them. Something personal that's, that's very important to you to share with our audience. So what would the scoop be? Uh, well, can I tell you that um, on a lighter note, I was... Uh, not a lighter note, a serious note. <laughs> when I left uh, secondary school, uh, I left with the, the record in the 100 meters and 200 meters. Very impressive. I was a sprinter. Uh, I enjoyed my sports. And that helped you doing the avoiding uh, in the rugby yeah, as well, and, the sprinting. And, yes. And uh, when you have a good move in uh, politics, you say you have sidestepped that fellow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the scoop with Honorable Musalia Mudabari. Join me again next week when I'll be talking to yet another great African personality from me and the entire team of The Scoop from here in Nairobi, Kenya. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mudabari. It's you. been a real pleasure. Really enjoyed that. Asante Thank sana. you so much. I hope you, you managed to...